Hey, we are live, folks. Welcome to episode 3,250 of the Survival Podcast. Uh, we're going to get right into it today, not really have much of an introductory segment because I expect this will go long. I have worked for two weeks on the presentation that you are about to see. It's the first time I've ever given it, but I've been putting it together, whittling it down, expanding it out, contract, and expand, contract, expand. Uh, trying to come up with something that will work as a podcast, but if you're listening to the audio, this might be one where you want to go get the video version of because it's going to have a lot of slides in it that explain a lot of what I'm talking about, yet I think it will be easy to understand and comprehend without them. I also do have a, uh, a page set up that goes along with this. I just published it a little bit uh, before uh, this, uh, this episode uh, was started. And uh, I'll, I'll let you see it here right now. If you give me just a second, folks, because that's the wrong one. Biochar resources page. And this is like all the, the very best of the best information that I've gleaned over about the last two months of really digging deeper into this subject. And, and that is at the survivalpodcast.com forward slash uh, biochar. Really, really simple. And uh, that page will remain up long term and uh, you'll be able to access it at any time. It might be one of those ones worth bookmarking because uh, I will be up updating it across time as I uh, more and more find good, valid information. I know there's going to be a lot of questions today. I think a lot of them will get answered in the presentation, uh, so I will not really be addressing them on the fly at all. And uh, we'll just uh, dig on into it. And again, I want to preface this with I am not an expert on biochar at all. Uh, I'm actually very new to it, and I don't claim to be any kind of an expert, but I think I've developed a fundamental understanding of it. And I have a, a pretty good way of teaching uh, complex situ uh, subjects and, and making them understandable. So that's what I'm going to try to do today. Now, it is also going to be probably a long ep episode. Uh, for those on the live video, there may actually come a point where I ha actually have to take a break, uh, biological needs or what have you. I expect this will go about two hours with Q&A, maybe even a little bit more, longer than typical for sure. I thought about breaking it into two episodes, but I really think it'll work better as something that you can watch straight through. So that's how we're going to do it. Now, I want to start out talking about just what biochar is and what it isn't. And the terminology I've come up with for this is all biochar is charcoal, but not all charcoal is biochar. When we're dealing with biochar, we're dealing with a substance that has been completely and totally taken down to nothing, well, almost nothing but pure carbon. And so one of the things that you'll notice if you make good biochar and you, get, you stick your hands into it, your hands will turn black as coal, right? Because that's what it is. But if you go and run water over your hands and rinse your hands with nothing but water, no soap, your hands will be you know, mostly clean. There won't be a lot of residue staying on your hands. If you go and take a bag of Kingsford briquette charcoal that has all sorts of volatiles left in it, it's not completely pure and you get your hands completely covered in the, the blackness from that, and you go to wash your hands, you're going to notice very quickly that, uh, that, that, that it will not rinse from your hands at all without having a significant uh, solvent like soap to get it off. And that's because there's tars and oils and other residues that are still in that charcoal. And what we're looking for when we make biochar is what I have on the screen for you right now. These are electric microscope, electron microscope images of various different biochars at you know different magnifications. And what you'll see is there's all these little holes like in the structure of wood. And these are basically the tubes that, that nutrient and, and liquid water flow through in the tree during its lifetime. And they're left there like these little straws. And there, there's, there's, you know, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of them. Think of, think of them, like, not the same, but think of them like the capillaries of the tree or whatever plant matter that we're using to make this. And there's far more of this with woody mass like hardwoods and softwoods. 
And that's why they make superior biochar for the type of thing that we're talking about today. And what I've come away with in all of my research and work so far is biochar is to the soil as coral is to the sea. And what I'm speaking about there is kind of a coral reef effect that biochar actually attracts all of these different beneficial microorganisms because they can live in those little tubules. They can live in those little holes. They're good places to be. It also holds nutrients and minerals and things like that. We'll get into that in a bit. But it provides a structure. And as life begins to adhere to that structure, more life adheres to that life. So if we go someplace and we put down a whole bunch of rock in the ocean, little little life will begin to cling to it. Eventually, we'll get some corals on there. And they'll start to build onto that. And actually, you'll have a brand new coral reef if it's in the right temperature and the right uh, life is present. And that structure is inherently beneficial. And the longer it's there, the more life that it will be begat. Life will begat life on top of life on top of life. And this has a lot to do with some things we'll cover today, which is along the electronic, uh, the, the, the electrical properties and the magnetic properties of biochar that actually cause some of these, these things to, to be attracted to it. And we'll talk a little bit in a second about the difference between absorption and adsorption and, and a lot more. But big thing I want to tell you today as we go through this, I developed this intro this entire, or this entire, I guess you'd call this almost like a little workshop for you guys, for people that want to do this in a suburban backyard, honestly, uh, a small homestead like mine of a few acres or a small farm. I'm not really going to go into a lot on the commercial applications and some of the things that are possible at larger scale today, though I'll allude to them a little bit with one slide. I want 90% of what you take from this to be things that you can start doing and practicing in your own backyard. So there's already been a question about how biochar is different from wood ash. And I think I've already kind of hit on how it's different than what we think of as like charcoal that we buy for our barbecue. But it's different from wood ash. And I'm going to go ahead and kill that question off because I'll answer it here. It's not ash at all. It's, it's char, coal, not ash. Ash is where the coal burns completely and then you're left with ash and what you have there is basically a soil liming agent something that will give you some potash and what have you but it'll it's really more to move the ph of soil while biochar is somewhat alkaline it doesn't really move soil that much and i'll, I'll talk about what it does do for some soils later on but it's not ash it's coal and the way we make it is we take a feedstock, and, and this was something I found in somebody else's deck, and it was pre-made. I, I prefer to use a woody feedstock. In this case, they're using something like switchgrass. And they're putting it through a process called pyrolysis. And pyrolysis means that we're heating it very, very high intense heat, but no oxygen. And that causes the gas within the feedstock to be released into the air. And then we can burn that feedstock There's a, or burn that gas in fact, in many of the ways I'm going to show you today, that gas is, is part of the entire burn the entire time, and we're unable to capture that gas. But in commercial systems, they can actually take some of the gas, we call syn gas or synthetic gas, it can actually be captured and used and burned, and it will burn pretty much like natural gas. It's pretty comparable in BTUs and cleanliness of burn. We get the solids out of that. That's the biochar. There might be a little bit of ash, but we want as little ash as possible. And we're going to quench the char at the end and rinse the ash from it. We're not looking for ash. We're looking for the char. And in commercial systems, we'll also get liquids. These are oils. You'll hear this referred to as wood vinegar. And wood vinegar, you probably have some in your house right now, whether you know it or not, uh, if, you, if you like to season food with liquid smoke. Liquid smoke is wood vinegar. There's just like certain requirements for something that humans are going to consume. And all of these outputs, and the one output that's not mentioned here is heat, can be used and harnessed. But you'll see that at our backyard scale, we have some limits as to how much of that we can make use of. I haven't seen a really good, easy to use backyard system that even harvests the, the wood vinegars yet. But I, 
I think that can be done. It's just I haven't gotten that far in my research yet because it is – people will call this as a, a byproduct, the wood vinegar a byproduct. I don't consider it a, a byproduct at all. It is a co-product. In fact, I believe the wood vinegar is as valuable as the biochar. The wood vinegar is an excellent uh, stimulant for germination. Uh, fire is a biostimulant. There are different disturbance uh, properties that stimulate different seeds to grow. There's millions of seeds in a cubic meter of existing soil when you look there and you see nothing. And if you compact the soil, you'll see certain seeds will germinate. If you disturb the soil, meaning to loosen it up, certain seeds will germinate. And if you simply, like if there's a grass layer there and you burn that grass, that fire will actually stimulate growth. There are plants that if they are not exposed to fire, they do not produce seed. The giant sequoias in redwoods of the west coast of the United States, they need fire to be stimulated to produce seed. So we can use that as well. And that's important to understand. Right now, if you want to use wood vinegar, my recommendation is Blue Sky Biochar sells a wood vinegar that's made from making biochar out of bamboo, and it's fantastic. And I'm going to be using it this year on my property. Not only will biochar do all these wonderful things, not only will wood vinegar improve germination rates, it's actually a pest deterrent as well. So much so that a very small amount of it in water sprayed onto your plants will deter pests. And it works so well that one of the cautions is if it's a, if a plant that requires uh, pollination, that as you start to get into kind of the pollination time, you stop using it because it will actually repel pollinators. It doesn't kill them, it just repels them. So what's the most famous use case for biochar? This goes back thousands and thousands of years, and I, I believe we don't really know how far back it goes. We know that it's, a, it's more than 2,000 years of use in the Amazon River Basin, and it is the genesis of a soil called Terra Preta. Now, there's a, I, I'm going to tell you that I'll cover this more as we go. There's a lot of misinformation there out there about biochar, there was literally a war on biochar for a while. Shocking that something that works would have a war against it, but we it, it happens. Um, but most of that has been disproven now. But I just want to make you aware, as you do research, you'll come up with a lot of things that people say about biochar that's simply not true. And part of it was changing what was being said in the first place. The Terra Preta soils, which are these amazing soils that were made by uh, First Peoples in, in the Amazon River Basin, were simply soil and biochar. And if you put that together, you got Terra Preta. That's not the case at all. That's not Terra Preta. Terra Preta um, allowed civilizations of millions of people to live on land that we previously didn't believe that there were millions of people living on. One of the early Spanish explorers, uh, basically deserted one half of the party with his half of the party and ended up floating down the entire Amazon River back in the 1500s. And when they got back, ragtag as they were with what was left of them, they described these massive cities. Nobody believed them. There's no way to grow enough food in those places is what they thought. And it was almost 100 years before anybody went back to check it out and they said, there's nothing here. These people are crazy. They, they lied. They're all dead now, so they can't speak for themselves. So screw them. Because they described like buildings upon buildings upon buildings all the way down the river, floating for a mile and never seeing two buildings not touching each other. You know, things like that. And what happened is this soil was so rich that when the people died off from diseases that were sown by first settlers, right, um, the, the, the jungle just took everything back. But eventually we, we found these soils. And if you look at the screen right now, what you're seeing is a soil profile. Terra Preta soil, which is oxisol and biochar. Oxisol is the typical soil of the rainforest. And on the, the where you see the orange looking stuff cut to the same depth, that's what the rainforest soils look like. If you just randomly dig a, a hole somewhere. One of the things I think that we don't understand, and this is part of the last couple of months of research that I've learned this terminology, is the Amazon is really a wet desert. We think of the rainforest as being so abundant and having so much going on for it, but it's really highly adapted, specialized trees and other woody perennials that are able to grow there because they can make a living on less nutrient. 
the humus that they drop, it gets eaten up really, really quick because it's always warm. It's moist so often. The microbes are so active. But they're able to hold the soil together and access that nutrient load where an annual crop really isn't able to do that. So what you have is a very nutrient-poor soil that leaches away nutrient. It gets constantly gets rain nine months out of the year and leaches away all its nutrient. When we go in and make terra preta, we end up with the, the most rich soil in the world. One thing we'll talk about a little bit is cation exchange. Cation exchange is just basically a number that says how good the soil is at holding nutrient and exchanging nutrient with plants. A lot of our farmland in the United States has cation exchange of like a two to a four to a six. Six are doing pretty good right now. Native prairie soils, when, when we first got here, the native prairie soils that were being maintained by the Native Americans and the bison uh, had cation exchanges somewhere in the neighborhood of the 20s to 30s. A, there, a, a pure organic mass so it's not just regular topsoil or clay. It's all like full on, like a compost. We'll have a cation exchange of somewhere between 200 and 400. Some of the soils of Terra Preta tested after 500 plus years of not being touched or used have cation exchange in the number around 200. It's unheard of in the United States, uh, the, 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 the breadbasket of the world, to have such a high cation exchange rate. They remain fertile for thousands of years. Inside them, and this is where the misinformation begins, it wasn't just biochar. There was human waste. There were pottery shards, animal bones, shellfish remains. What they believe is when they started out with these middens where they would basically cook for a while and then they would end up all this char and that makes things not stink. So they would start disposing of their human waste there, right? And their other garbage, like all their waste from animal bones and stuff like that. And then when they would abandon that, move to the next one, when they saw the growth that came from it, they're like, hey, we're on to something. It was probably something that happened overall by accident. They accidentally figured this out. And if we don't mimic this in some way, all we're doing is throwing charcoal on soil and we're not going to get results, anything like this whatsoever. Um, one of the things that's really interesting, though, and this I, I find this fascinating personally. They analyzed this soil and they determined what the microbes were in it that were active beneficial microbes. And I don't think it's that astonishing that the particular combination of microbes that they found don't exist in that combination anywhere else in the world because it's never been done anywhere else in the world. But a few of the microbes are like, the only other place we've seen this microbe is like in Africa somewhere. So it wasn't just the combination wasn't there. That one particular microbe has only been discovered in soil samples from across an ocean, which has to make you wonder how it got there in the first place. Is there maybe a little more human traffic back and forth between continents than we tend to believe on how the entire Americas were settled by the first peoples? I think there were multiple movement into the area and humans transport microbes in our bodies, in our stomach, in our intestine. We by numbers are more bacteria than we are human cells. And so humans are a great way for bacteria and microbes and other things to be transported. And what we do know these people were doing because of the amount of pottery shards we found in these, these burials is they were actually using the pottery as a pot. So they would have a poo pot and a pea pot. And they would put charcoal into these pots, and then they would use the, the facilities. And man learned a long time ago when dealing with his own waste, separate liquid and solid. And eventually you'd get this pot full of biochar and other carbon material. And they would just simply throw these pots into these middens or into these areas that they were improving and you might think, well, that's wasteful to throw that pot away, but they had an unending supply of clay and no shortage of manpower. So when you have a, something like that, they might have even been adding soils to it to combine the whole thing, inoculate everything, and then planting things like avocado or other tree crops into the pot. Then you put the whole pot into the ground. The plant then breaks the pot open because they found these shards and these patterns. They can tell that some of this was done. 
I've had people since I started talking about this tell me, Jack, maybe it's not pottery shards. Maybe it's the clay itself was heated up and fired by the creation of the charcoal. That looks very different than a pottery shard. Pottery shards have shape to them. They have a uniform thickness. They are clearly man-made. And some of these uh, digs, it's just there's almost as much pottery as there is soil. So that's, that's important to just think about the fact that we know these soils are anthropomorphic. They were made by man. So I want to focus mostly on what biochar can do for you in your garden or on your farm or what have you. But I want you to realize, like, we don't even have a clue how many uses for this stuff we're going to find. We've only really begun to rediscover what is truly ancient wisdom. Uh, one of the things that biochar will do for us is actually just simply re reduce smell and nutrient off-gassing in our livestock bedding. And as you'll see later, this is a great way to get biochar into our soil as well eventually. But we've all had the day where you walk in the chicken coop or what have you, and you're like, poof, I need to add some more carbon. Boy, this is starting to have a bit of an ammonia smell. Well, if every time you put down a layer of your uh, bedding, you're also putting down, let's say, a bucket or a half a bucket of biochar, you're going to have a lot less of that off-gassing smell. And eventually, what are you going to do with that bedding? You're going to compost it. Now you've got inoculated biochar in your compost. You, you, all you did was add dumping it into there. Uh, it will also imp imp improve feed efficiency in livestock. Here's another little scandalous thing that's been done in regards to biochar. So it used to be legal to put biochar in livestock feed in the United States. I think California has a loophole law that says you can do it there. But it was removed as a feed additive from the U.S. agricultural code. So you can't, you can't buy feed that's impregnated with biochar now, and you're not supposed to add biochar to feed if you're selling to other humans, which is dumb. It was legal forever. So why would they do this? Well, if you sell people feed, you don't really want them adding their own biochar because then they're going to buy less feed because feed efficiency use is in the neighborhood of uh, improve, it, it reduced uh, how much feed the animal has to consume from somewhere between 15 and 25%, depending on the animal, the feed, et cetera. Call it 20%. So just by adding biochar to your animal feed, you can reduce the amount of feed you have to, to give them 15, 20%. But what happens now? Well, now that biochar doesn't stay in their body. It doesn't accumulate. It passes through their system. One of the reasons it improves feed efficiency is it absorbs toxins, adsorbs toxins, not absorbs toxins. And then they pass it in their waste. Well, if they pass their waste into the bedding, the waste already stinks less. It's already starting to, 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 to absorb that stink, that smell, to bind up that nitrogen before it comes out. But now it's more biochar in the bedding, so it's going to be there when you do your compost in your soil. Or they make deposits at random, as animals do, on your land, adding carbon to your soil when you don't do anything except add it to their feet. And I'm going to tell you, they like it. It's not like you have to trick them into eating it. One of the ways that people have gotten around this whole stupid law that says you can't add it to their feed because it's not an approved feed additive is they have just simply put biochar out in like a feed tray because the animals will eat it. You don't have to trick them into eating it. They like it. I, I, I feed it to my ducks and my chickens, and I watch the chickens in particular see a piece of biochar and pick it out of the feed and actually making sure that they get a certain amount of it. It's kind of like an extra treat for them. Animals naturally, will, when you go into the woods where you find charcoal in the woods, animals will seek out and eat charcoal because they know that it's good for them. They have an intrinsic knowledge of, of what to eat and what not to eat. It's mankind's oldest medication. It can bind up human waste in off-grid situations. We've had people on talk about composting toilets. Everybody claims they don't stink. When you push them, they're like, well, you know, it, it, it stinks a little bit. Well, if you were adding biochar to your composting toilet situation, you're going to have a lot less odor. You're also going to have biochar that by the end of that human the human manure process of composting human manure, it's going to be fully inoculated and ready to go. Um, it also, though, is an insulation in alternative building technologies. So it actually has a very high insulation rate. So it can be added to things like plasters, 
Uh, and you, I, I, I've never seen anybody do it yet, but I would imagine things like air Creta could be added to. And this has a, a number of effects. One is that it actually has a higher R value for insulation than most other things, but it breathes. So you can get a very highly insulated structure, but you don't end up with sick home syndrome where you start cultivating mold inside your home. But it actually has some electromagnetic properties where you might find that if you don't put some sort of a, a mechanism around it, your cell phone may not work in your house anymore. Your house is, it can become a Faraday cage if enough of it's used in the right way. It's pretty interesting to me. It also can remediate toxic soils. One example was, there was I think it was a cashew farm. It was something like that. And they were growing these, these cashews for export. And the regulations changed. And I think it was somewhere like Sri Lanka or something like that uh, to the United States about how much cadmium uh, could be in your cashews. And so, yeah, like as though any amount of cadmium in your cashews is okay. Well, they had like five years where you could still eat the cadmium. And then they had to get either, you know, stop producing from this, this orchard or they had to uh, figure out a solution. What they ended up doing was trenching in biochar along the drip lines where the trees were watered and fertigated. And within six months, the numbers went down to where they could meet the new standard. That's, that's pretty impressive. So there's a lot of places that we really need to do remediation and biochar can help us do that as well. Um, aquatic systems filtration. Every aquarist, I have aquariums behind me here, knows the power of charcoal in an aquarium system. So there's a lot that we can do there. Preventing pesticide runoff in groundwater. Simply having biochar, especially like at the edges of riparian areas around uh, fields, can prevent a lot of pesticide and nutrient from getting into the creeks and rivers and streams and eventually the ocean. Uh, lightning potting soil instead of perlite and peat. It's important that it be inoculated biochar. We'll talk about inoculation in a bit. But whenever we do potting soil for plants, we want lightweight soils that allow the root formation for good transplants out into the field. Well, peat is an environmental disaster the way we keep harvesting peat moss. And perlite is something that we either have to, it's not the most environmentally friendly thing. It's, I don't think it's as bad as peat for the environment, you know, pulling all this peat up out of these old peat bogs, this ancient locked up material. Um, but it's not something we can make at home either. It's something we have to buy in. And so if we can do the same thing with something like biochar, then we're far ahead of the game and we're more self-sufficient. The other thing about that is if you put perlite in your soil, it's pretty much a permanent thing, but it will end up floating up and washing away as anybody that's ever had potted plants using potting soil knows it somehow will tend to end up at the surface. But if it stays in the soil, it may lighten the soil, but it doesn't really do much for soil organisms. The big thing that you need to understand about biochar and why it's worth the work that it takes to do, it's permanent and it's like a fine wine in a wine rack properly stored. If it's a good red, if it's a, let's say it's a good old vine Zinfandel from Oregon, one of my favorite wines. And it's a 2020. If I properly store it for five more years, it will get better. That's how bio, biochar is. It lasts. If we put peat in our in our starts and then we plant that out, that peat is, is eaten up and gone by the end of that garden season. That charcoal, every time we put plant out our, our transplants, we're improving our soil forever. They say it's probably a thousand years or more that biochar is a, a half-life of about a thousand years. Uh, so it's still there, just not as like some of the carbon actually does begin to break down and release back into the atmosphere. Thousand years. We live 100 if we're lucky. That's forever in my book. And of course, there's a soil amendment, which is the main stuff we're going to talk about today. Now, moving on. What makes good feedstock? Feedstock is simply the stuff that we take and we turn into biochar. Technically, anything carbon based, you can turn into char. You can make bone into char. I've seen people like, like a jawbone of a cow into charcoal. It's, it's pretty neat looking. I've seen it done with giant beetles. I've seen some videos like it's those giant freaking monster beetles. They'll char them dead, of course. And they, if you do it in what's called a retort, and I'll talk about that in a second, uh, they come out looking exactly like they went in, except you can crumble them into uh, charcoal. But tree trimmings and slash 
are probably the number one feedstock that we all will have access to. You know, if you live in the suburbs, certain times of year, you can just walk up and down the road. And in a lot of places, the city will take away material only if it's bundled up in a nice size bundles. So I used to do that for firewood when I lived in Arlington in a suburb. I could just walk around and just take everybody's bundled up, you know, thick, you know, wrist thick stuff. Well, you can do that for biochar too. If you live out in the country, you're probably doing pruning and trimming every year. All of the stuff, you know, that's finger sized and up, that's heavy woody material is good biochar stuff. Wood cuttings from sawmills. If you have somebody near you that's, that's milling lumber or making uh, cabinetry or something like that, they tend to have a ton of waste wood. And the way they get rid of it, they just throw it in a barrel and they burn it to ash or they pay somebody to take it away. You may find that somebody might actually pay you to go get material if you find the right connection. Wood chips are actually great for biochar, depending on the method. It depends. Some methods are do, do really well turning wood chips into biochar, and some other methods, they don't really work well for wood chips, but they make great biochar. Agricultural waste, like corn stover. Corn stover is the, the stalks and the cobs, or even just the cobs. It makes good biochar. I don't think for our purposes it's as good as a woody mass because it doesn't have quite the same type of structure, so you don't end up with something that has as much home for the microbes. What is a good carbon source? Sunflower stalks and heads, switchgrass, livestock manure can actually be made into biochar. Sewage solids can be made into biochar, which is a huge economic or, uh, environmental problem we have right now as to what to do with all the sewage. I covered recently how they're making compost out of it, but it's really poor quality compost. I don't know if you're putting in a wood lot of just random crap trees, uh, it, it might be okay for that or a lawn, but for growing food, it is just not good quality. I'm not even worried about the toxins in it. And I don't think it makes the best biochar for ag use, but there's a lot of other uses like construction uses, like road base, like we talked about with building structures and stuff. And any toxins that remain in it are going to be bound up and not released into the environment. Uh, Bagassi, that's sugarcane waste. So all the stocks from sugarcane makes pretty good biochar. Nut holes, wood pallets, again, anything carbon-based. But the important thing to understand for you, if you're a backyard person that's going to use some of the methods I'm about to give you to make this, a lot of that stuff won't make great biochar for you. It has to be in some type of a retort system where basically the flames never touch the thing you're making in a carbon Heat on the outside pushes the gas out of the retort and you bake it. And the easiest methods to use are cone kilns and, and barrels and stuff like that. And so a lot of this stuff won't make good biochar that way. But here you can see what the results are. So in the switchgrass, you'll notice that they're in pellet form and you end up with pelletized charcoal, which is really easy to crumble. And you might think, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense, though, to be going to something like a pellet fuel to make biochar. But what if you need the heat for something else and you simply use a pelletized heater and normally all you would do is use the pellets, get the heat and pay for the pellets to get the heat. But if you got pellets and you made heat and biochar, things might look a little bit differently from a production stand. And then something has to be done with this material. And generally this material is simply burnt up or if it is used to make compost, most of the carbon ends up back in the atmosphere in a single season. Making compost actually releases a ton of carbon into the atmosphere. When we bind the carbon up permanently in biochar and put it in the soil, it stays there for a human lifetime. All right, home production methods. I'm pretty proud of the picture on the left uh, of your screen, the, the vertical one. That's my cone kiln, but my grandson took that picture. And I think it does a good job of explaining why this makes charcoal instead of ash. If you look at the flames in that picture, you'll notice that they're burning well above the wood. The wood does not have a lot of flame on it. This is because the way these cones work is if you think about how you build a fire, you make a pyramid, thin at the top and white at the base, and then you light your fire and we get airflow through the pyramid. If you think about what a cone is, it's a back-sized pyramid. And so what ends up happening, when you first start the fire, there'll be pretty decent airflow capable of getting down into the kiln. 
and it will it will start to burn. It will smoke some. But as you keep adding material layer by layer, the bottom material is extremely hot. It's like an oven in there, and it's it's baking out the gas. And the gas is coming at the top, and it's robbing the oxygen from the material below. That's how all of these types of cone kilns work. Cone kilns, pyramid kilns, and you see there's more and more like a trough there. The nice thing about the long trough style kilns is that we can put larger, longer material that we put less work into sizing into them. And uh, it's actually a pretty easy method, and it makes a reasonable amount of biochar. The one that I have there is on my resources page. It's called the Best Biochar Kiln. I did a, uh, a an interview years ago when it was given to me uh, with, I think her last name was Flora. I don't remember her first name right now, but my interview with her is on there. It's not very big. It's, you know, about like, as you can see me on the camera, about that big across the top. It's about 11 inches deep and about yay round at the bottom. The innovation with it is it's made out of a relatively thin but good steel, and it comes in three pieces, so it can be shipped flat. So it's still kind of expensive for shipping. I think it's like 25 bucks or something like that for shipping. It is heavy, um, but you put it together with pop rivets that come, the little rivet gun and all the rivets come with it, and you put it together yourself, and it has a little opening in the bottom, a little gap that would let air in. You throw a little dirt in the bottom of it before you do your burn, and then you use it. The advantage is of all of them, though, because this is, again, let me go back. Like, there's a pyramid kiln in the bottom uh, right side, and that works the same way. All of these work the same way by robbing oxygen from the bottom by burning it at the top. Um, but when you, when you get this going, super simple, makes a good volume fast. That relatively small kiln out there... When I get down to a finished crushed product, which is under a quarter inch in size crushed, I get about eight to 10 gallons of biochar from a single burn. That's a very usable quantity. It's easy to quench. And I'm going to talk a little bit later about why you want to quench from the bottom if you can. But you can kind of just run the water from a hose down one side of it. And, you know, that dirt's down there in that gap with this particular model. Many of them don't have any gap at all. They're all welded tight. So the water begins to fill up from the bottom. And the steam does a really good job of cleaning out the pores of any residues that are left over. And so they're really easy to quench. And when I did this, the first couple burns I did, I would spray it, spray it, spray it. And it would steam and steam and steam. And I spray it until it stopped steaming. And it was still, it would dry very quickly then. And you, you're supposed to spread it out and make sure that it's all out. If you see any smoking, hit it with a, uh, or, you, you know, hit it with a hose or else it can, end up like one little ember you come back the next day and your whole kiln is nothing but ash and all burned to nothing if you lost it all what i do now is i completely saturate it at the end of a burn i mean i soak it even though some water's leaking out the bottom i run that hose full blast until it fills all the way up like soup it completely extinguishes the char at that point it rinses all the ash out the bottom and the other thing that happens when you hit it with that water Water goes into those little cracks and pores in the biochar and it turns the steam instantly and it's got a lot of pressure and it shatters it. So it makes breaking it up into crushing it later easier to do, in my opinion. Um, and they do work even with fresh cut fleet feedstock. We made some recently, my grandson and I, it was a bunch of prunings and stuff that had been around for a couple months after they were pruned. Wetter than would be ideal didn't really do great in the beginning. But once that process gets going, there's so much heat and so much power, even in these little kilns, that it drives and boils off that moisture rather quickly. And since you add them the, the, by the batch, so when you're doing this, you get your fire going, it'll smoke a bit, it'll start to, to you add another layer, it'll burn another layer. When you get about 20% of the kiln into a, a bed of coals, this is when it really starts to work well. And you throw another layer completely covered, it'll smoke just a bit when you do that, it'll go back to a clean burn, and when that layer starts to ash over a little bit, then you add another layer. That's how you know when to add more. Um, the disadvantages of that are you have to be there. And so it takes us about an hour to two hours to do a full burn with a kiln this size depending on how good the, the feedstock is, how dry it is, the drier, the faster. Uh, you have to constantly feed it. You have to be there and pay attention. You have to have material that will fit in the, the, you know, the cone, and it needs to be somewhat similar in size. 
if you have little pieces and big pieces, a lot of your big pieces by the end of the burn will not be fully carbonized. It's okay. You set them aside. You pitch it back in the next burn. Um, trying to make sure I get you guys' questions here. I'm going to do the best I can with this. And there will be some smoke at times. Like a lot of the retorts and stuff, like the next method I'm going to show you, there's almost no smoke ever. Right at the very beginning, but once the process is initiated, you don't have smoke. When you're using one of these open kilns, every time you add that next batch, you're going to have some smoke for a while. So if you're in an area where that can cause you problems, uh, just know that that is one of the issues you'll deal with. The next, I've used the word a couple times, a retort. Now I want to kind of show you, well, what is a retort? A retort is what a lot of people think they need to make charcoal. When I when I posted pictures of our kiln running, people were like, how do you make charcoal like that? Why isn't it just a you know a forest fire or whatever, a, a barbecue fire? And I think I've explained that now, but this is kind of the method that people think of when they, they think of making charcoal. Like you'd make char cloth. You take a little can, you put some cloth in it, you put a lid on it, some very small pinholes so that there's a place for the gas to come out, set that can in, in, a, fi in a bed of coals in a fire, and in no time at all, you'll turn the cloth on the char cloth. And that's what we can use with, you know, wilderness fire starting. One tiny spark on char, char cloth, and we're going to be able to get to a flame very quickly and get some tinder going and get a fire going. And so this is basically that done at a higher scale. This one's known as the Tin Man Retort. And the way it works is you take a 30-gallon ga steel barrel, and you put it inside a 50-gallon steel barrel, and you add a chimney to it for some pull. You then, before you put the lid on though you, you put woody material all around the space in between the two barrels inside the 50 gallon barrel and a bunch of it on the top and you light it from the top and you let it burn until it begins to get burning and that outer barrel ha has air holes in the bottom and the top so it can breathe it can pull oxygen that material is going to be burned up to ash there's not going to be any real charcoal from that material but the bulk of the material goes inside the 30 gallon barrel the 30 gallon gallon barrel <clears throat> has some little tiny holes in the bottom. And as the heat builds up, the gas, at first it's going to push the steam out of the wood. It's going to dry the wood inside the retort. And so that's when you'll get some smoke and some steam. But eventually that wood will get dry and it'll start to push gas out of that barrel into the larger barrel. And eventually all your feedstock that went into the outer barrel is gone. And yet it keeps burning. Because there's so much heat's been burned up, the gas coming out of the retort is now what's burning. And it sounds like a jet engine when it's running. It makes very good quality biochar. And it's got some real advantages. One, self-regulation. You don't have to continuously feed it. It will take you somewhere in the neighborhood of about an hour to get it going to the point where you can kind of walk away from it. Safety concerns, of course, are still there. Uh, but if you put it in the right location where it can't really cause any trouble, it's not going to. Uh, so once you're done, you don't have to be there at the end of the burn to quench it with water. It will it will stop on its own. It won't ever, you won't come back, open it up the next day after it's cooled off and see a pile of ash in the bottom. It makes reasonable amounts. I don't think it makes much more than my little kiln does, though, per batch. Because that 30-gallon barrel is going to have a significant reduction. My kiln, I just keep adding and adding and adding till it's full. And then, you know, let it burn out at the end and then quench it. When you fill up that 30-gallon uh, barrel inside the 55-gallon barrel, you can only fit what will fit in there, right? And this, is, this does not work well with wood chips. What ends up happening with wood chips is they pack so dense that the outside of them chars and then the inside ends up usually being completely unburned. Now, I've never seen anybody do this. I would think if you were to make a mix of like stick type wood in the center and wood chips on the outside, that you could probably use a blend of feedstock that way in one of these. I to, Full disclosure, I haven't built one of these. I haven't used one of these yet. Um, I've only, uh, what I know about these uh, Tin Man Retort, I know from uh, Bob Wells and Living Web Farms and New England Biochar. That's where that picture's from. And I have a tremendous number of workshops that you can watch on YouTube from these folks on that resources page that I was talking about. They also have a limited life cycle, but they're probably repurposed drums anyway that you can get for little to no money. Um, they do have to have feedstock that will size down and fit in that 30 gallon barrel. And the feedstock really needs to be well seasoned. 
really dry for this to work optimally because you have to have a significant gasification of what's inside the retort going by the time that the fuel wood that's on the outside has burned out or mostly out. So if you have really fresh cut feedstock, you're going to spend most of the energy just to dry it. And you're not going to have enough carryover to get a good char with its own gas. Because what's happening is the wood in the retort is providing the fuel to make charcoal out of itself eventually. That's what you're actually burning. And if you've ever made charcoal in a little can in like a fire, it will get to a point where if you take a pair of pliers, because you're not stupid, you don't want to burn yourself, and pick it up and pull it out of the fire, the little pinholes, you'll see flares of fire coming out of them. But nothing inside is actually burning. There's no oxygen in there. That's the gas acting like a little jet. And so that's what this is doing at a larger scale. Now, this one I know the least about. I'm not certain on this, but it might be the best one I've seen. This is a reverse of what we just talked about. This is called a hookway retort. And I think for this to find its full potential, it requires some good redneck engineers to play with it. It is essentially a rocket stove inside a barrel. And the rocket stove is what provides the heat. And if you look at the picture I'm showing you there, the one on the, on the right as you're looking at it that shows the internals, that big pipe that comes in the bottom and goes up the top, that's a rocket stove. The smaller pipe that you see that comes up almost to the top of the barrel, that is an intake. So your fuel wood for the burn goes inside the rocket stove pipe, and it gets loaded from the bottom and the top initially so you have enough burning to really get it drawn. As you can see, it looks like a flamethrower coming out the top. That heats up your fuel stock that's inside the barrel. And it begins to off-gas, but the gas can't get out because there's a lid on it. So the gas starts to build up a little pressure. That intake, that, that smaller pipe intake, sucks that gas down and burns it inside, inside the rocket stove. So you don't have flame in that big open area. This means you have the, the most of the area inside. Let's say if you built one out of a 50-gallon 50, 50 drum, you have most of that available for what will actually become char. It's a much better uh, volumetric ratio. And you can keep adding fuel wood until the gasification really begins. And once that gasification begins, I have a link to a video where you can see one of these running in the, uh, in the, uh, the, the resources page. And when it starts getting there, it starts going like, whoop, 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 whoop. and it sounds weird. It sounds almost like someone got a big giant moonshine still about to take off or something. And then it'll be like, whoop, 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 whoop. and then it'll just kick over. And when it kicks over, that's the point where there's enough gas coming out of the feedstock to supply all the, the fuel necessary to keep the burn going. And it sounds like a jet engine. It's really cool. Now, the reason that I think that this might have real potential if some redneck engineering were done to it and modified it is that I think you could eventually develop it to the point where the, the unit itself could be inside a structure like a greenhouse providing heat. Where the other ones I've shown you so far, that would be a good way to kill yourself. You don't want to burn indoors the way any of those do. But since this is essentially a rocket stove, it could be set up like a rocket mass heater, and we may be able to do that with it. Um, there's some real advantages. Self-regulation. Self you don't have to sit there and continuously feed it. Once it kicks over, once that initial startup's done, you let it go, and it will eventually run out of fuel, and it will stop. And you can come back the next day, and your biochar is ready for you. It makes very efficient use of space. It enables the use of heat if we make those modifications. I don't know if that's been done. Um, and it makes very high quality biochar. When I've looked at the results and seen people that have used it, what it looks like, it's very high quality. Disadvantage, more complex to build than anything I've shown you so far, more expensive to build. Again, your feedstock has to be size, has to fit in there. Um, it does need to be well seasoned or what's going to happen is you're not going to get, again, you're not going to get kicked over at a point long enough to sustain. And I've seen some of the burns done with it where maybe 10%, 15% of the material has got to be pitched back in the next burn and done again because you didn't get an efficient burn. And I think that's why. 
Uh, it does require about an hour of setup. And if you ever did modify it the way I'm talking about, unless you made some other modifications, it would be more labor intense to empty it because you're reaching down into a bin to get the stuff out rather than just being able to dump it. And then stu stupid, simple methods. There are some things then that makes very good biochar that is incredibly inexpensive to build. And you can source material just about anywhere in the world. A 50-gallon drum can be used to make biochar. You can make biochar on a 50-gallon drum just standing up like a burn barrel. You just don't put holes in it. And you keep adding material, and it keeps getting higher, and it works just like a cone kiln. But it takes longer to make charcoal with. But if you notice, the one here is propped up on a wheel, a car wheel. If you set the barrel on a 60-degree angle, then you, that's the same angle that, that, that they use in things like the Contiki cone kilns, the 60 degrees. So now we can put long feedstock down into that barrel, and we get a quicker result. Again, it's something we have to pay attention to. We have to be there, just like a cone kiln. Or you throw the barrel on its side, you take an angle grinder, and you basically make a trench kiln out of the barrel. Now, I have an idea for this. And there may be off-the-shelf product to make this happen. But these barrels usually have a bung at the top. Because for this type of thing, you want a barrel, for the one that you're going to lay on the side, you want a barrel that the, the, the top is welded onto it. So unless you're going to do that yourself with a welder, you're looking for a barrel that's already that way. Why not get one like that? And they have that bung on there. Now, the beauty is we can set that bung on the bottom. We could do our burn. At the end of the burn, we quench it with water. Yeah. And we're in good shape now, right? Except that barrel is going to be awful heavy with all that water in it. Well, if we took a bung wrench, we could just open the bung and the water comes out. But everybody I've seen that makes these, they say that after a time, a certain number of burns, basically that bung is not coming out anymore. It bends up fused because it's not designed to be used as an oven. So my thought is you take the bung out and you replace it with an adapter. The adapter goes to a piece of pipe, maybe a foot long, foot and a half long. And that metal pipe screws into whatever that adapter in that bung is. On the other end, take a standard three quarter inch hose bib and screw that on there. You know, one you can open with the lever. And then when you start your fire initially, it would actually be good to have some airflow until your fire was well established and you had some coals to work with. So open it and allow airflow on that sideways mounted uh, barrel. Once you get your fire established and you start adding material, you close it. You don't want airflow. You want to go back to that, that standard biochar making technique. But here's the cool part. When you're ready to quench... Remember I said quench from the bottom? Hook a garden hose up to it, open it, turn the garden hose on, and flood it from the bottom up, getting that awesome steam effect across all of the charcoal. You can fill it all the way up eventually, but you can let it steam first to clean out those pores. Yeah? Now, close the valve, disconnect the hose, and when you're ready, open it, drain the barrel. Or take the hose bib, uh, the other end where the hose is hooked up to, off, Put it somewhere you want to water a tree, open it up, and water the tree with all that great carbon residue that comes out of there. You're, you're good to go. So I, I think that maybe for the backyard, this might be the simplest, easiest. And if you think about it, if you watch some of the videos of people doing this, they end up with almost a full barrel. They make 45, 50 gallons of char in one burn. That's significant. That's way more than my little cone kiln does. So this is probably something... Uh, we're going to play with. Real quick, commercial scale kilns. Um, they can obviously make biochar, but we talked about some of the other components like the gas, like the heat, like the wood vinegar. Well, these are commercial level kilns. And this, I don't remember where I found the top one. The bottom one here, um, that particular one is made by New England Biochar. And it actually heats water that is pumped underground inside a one acre greenhouse and heats the soil below the plants and extends the season of the greenhouse by months as a byproduct of making the biochar, which they also use to improve the soil in the greenhouse and on the farm. That's pretty creative. You can also do direct forced air heating of a structure. That particular one there, not only does the greenhouse, it actually takes some of its heat it, by forced air into 
uh, the building that you see behind it in an area where they stack all their feedstock. So they basically have a kiln drying wood storage system. They're getting a lot of material from a sawmill. So they're getting all of the slash, the outside material. It's pretty good shape by the time they get it, but it's still somewhat moist. Well, they stack it in there and they force the heat, the excess heat into that building and dry their material for their future runs. So there's a lot that we can do with it. We want to use the energy if we can. And this is what's lacking at home scale for now anyway. Um, they could generate electricity. Anything that makes heat can spin a turbine. Anything that makes heat from wood is going to produce gas. Some of the gas can be harvested as syn gas, and you can run a generator with it. So you can pr produce electricity. The thing is you're going to get bursty electricity. You're not going to burn even like a small scale commercial, you're probably not going to burn all the time, nonstop, 24 seven. You don't always have power. You have bursty power. So at times you don't have any power. And at times you have more power than you need and more power than you can use. So one of the things you could do with it is put it into a battery for later use. That's a significant expense. Or you could use the surplus energy to mine Bitcoin, which is a great place to plug Bitcoin into any bursty energy source. You could harvest the wood vinegar. And like I said, it may be as important as the biochar as an agricultural product. Um, it is used extensively in Asia. Every little farmer goes to the store. They, they, they can buy it at the hardware store the way you can buy plant food. And it's pretty cheap. They buy a couple liters of it and you use a few milliliters to the gallon of water. And they spray their fields when they seed them and they get much higher germination rates, again, because of the stimulative nature of Smoke. Smoke is a stimulant uh, for biological activity. They can run with auto feed systems, some of these systems. So these are going to be the ones that are doing things like rice holes or bagasse or something like that, right? These smaller materials. And they'll basically have a corkscrew. And the material is going in on one side and coming out the other already small-sized fine biochar. So that, that is a system that can run 24-7. As long as the hopper's full, it can keep running. It can keep making heat, and it can keep making energy, and it can keep making things like uh, wood vinegar. You could do that with crushed bamboo, for instance, and that makes a very high-quality uh, wood vinegar. And you can heat ponds. If you heat water, you can heat ponds. So you could do aquaponics. You could have a greenhouse that is a combination soil-based and aquaponics system and your large ponds, you could actually be moving water through your 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 uh, your biochar uh, system and actually warming that water. And you would be able to determine how hot the water got by how fast you moved it through the system. Now, these are not boiler systems, most of them that are being set up where there's a danger of an explosion. These are open-ended systems. We're not heating the water to the temperature of boiling. We're bringing the water up 10, 20, 30 degrees from where it, where it came in at. And we could also monitor that by, well, once the pond reaches a certain temperature, we stop moving the water through the system. Or maybe we move different water to, again, heat things in the soil. It's pretty amazing uh, what can be done with this. So how do you know if you made biochar that you made biochar? You didn't make Kingsford, right? You made something that you would really want to put into your soil. Number one, you should have a low volume of ash, so when you see a little bit of ashing over, a lot of times when you're getting near the end of a burn with one of these cone kilns, it looks like, boy, that's a lot of ash. As soon as you hit it with water, it just rinses right off and you see that it was just surface ash. Uh, next, there should be no real flame left in your open kilns, your cone kilns. You should let it burn until maybe there's a little flame here or there. You may have a stray piece of material on the surface that you can tell, like, if I wait for that to char then we're going to start having the underneath turn to ash. That's fine. But we should have pretty much killed all that. One of the great things you can do, a good practice with this, is right at the end of your burn, throw a shit ton of very fine, small, hot, fast-burning material on to get one last big burn out of it, and it will totally choke off what's underneath it. Uh, and that may not produce a lot of char for you, that, that fine material like grass, or really high, you know, highly flammable leaves or twigs or something like that. But it will help kind of finish everything off for you. When it's dry, if you've made biochar, it should sound like glass, right? It should sound like glass when you when you pick it up and drop it. it it's it's somewhat almost crystalline. It should crush easily. If you pick up a piece of it, you should be able to take your hand and just crush it in your hand. One of my rules for what I do with my biochar. When I crush it, we'll talk about crushing in a second, is if it doesn't crush easily to go through a quarter-inch screen, 
I put it in a bucket and somewhere in the middle of my next burn, I dump it back in there. Cause I figure if it doesn't crush easy, it didn't get fully pyrolyzed. Um, and it, well, I said earlier, it should wrench clean from your hands. My biochar, I mean, you stick your hands in it. You're like, Oh man, I'm going to really have to scrub my hands. Now you, you turn the hose on and I mean, your hands go almost completely clean without any soap. If you have a lot of volatiles and tars and oils and your charcoal, that won't happen. You'll end up having to scrub your hands much harder to get them clean. So that's that's really a good indicator. Your burn was mostly smoke-free. Like I said, as you add batches in a cone kiln or a barrel kiln or something like that, you're going to get some smoke. But the majority of your burn should have been very smoke-free. And your yield should be about 30% by dry weight if you had dry stock going in. 30% by volume, 40% by volume would be a good indicator too. And I don't ever worry that much about that. I don't have a good quantifiable way to know how much was in my wheelbarrow and the other stuff my grandkid dr drug over there. Uh, I'm more concerned with if I get glass sounds when it's dry, my hands rinse clean and it crushes easily, I know I'm dealing with good biochar. It's really that simple. Once char is made, you do need to crush it. The general advice is smaller is better. You have to think about the organisms that are going to live in your biochar. You need a microscope to see them. If you had a two-inch piece of charcoal, that organism during its entire life would never be able to get from one end of it to the other if it tried, and it's not going to. So more pieces per gram is better in your soil because it's more distributed that way. Um, and it also can only do so much good for the soil if it's in big chunks. Then basically only the outer surface works. When we crack it into little pieces, the surface area of a couple of grams is like equivalent to the surface area of like a 2,500 square foot house. And so the more pieces we make per ounce of char, the more we can do in the soil. Uh, maximum size in general good practice is about a quarter inch. Again, I just have a screen with half inch hardware cloth and a screen with quarter inch hardware cloth. I take the biochar, I dump it on the, the and I, I, you want it wet when you do this so it doesn't make dust because biochar, you can eat it. It's one another way I should have said about, I, I need to add to that slide for the future. One way you would know you make good biochar is if you take a bite of it, it doesn't taste bad. It tastes almost like nothing. And it crunches up and you can eat it. If you can feed it to your animals, you could feed it to yourself. Um, but you want to make sure it's wet. So I take it and I put it on that, that half inch piece of hardware cloth screen and I take a hoe and I push it through it. And everything that pushes easily through it, I then go through the quarter inch screen. That way I'm only crushing the stuff that didn't really easily go. If it doesn't easily go through a half inch screen, I throw it in the bucket. Then I take it and I drive my vehicle over all the stuff that didn't go through the quarter inch screen. I put them in some sandbags, lay the sandbags down, drive across them. This is the weak link for me on labor right now. I'm not happy with how much effort this takes. But after a couple turns of that, if, if it still doesn't want to go through that quarter inch screen, I throw it in the same bucket with the other stuff and it goes in the next burn. And that way it'll be more likely to shatter. Now, again, if you quench your char, a lot of the work will be done for you. And the first time you go to put it through a screen, a ton of it will just go through there on its own. And I basically use the big 20-gallon mixing tray tubs for concrete. And I lay that where I do my compost stuff for my chickens. And I put the screen over it. And that way I have a big tub for it to fall into. It's really, really quite easy to do. Um but a commercial quality leaf vacuum is perfect. And Steel makes one that's about 250 bucks. Michael Whitman of Blue Sky Biochar says that's the thing to do. I'm going to probably break down and buy one. Because what happens, that leaf vac sucks that biochar up. It goes through the impeller. And that bag is designed to not let dust go everywhere. I've seen some people do it. And it seems like okay results with a leaf shredder. But a lot of like a commercial wood chipper. But most people will tell you you'll make a cloud of dust with it. I have one. I think I'm better off doing something that people within the industry say works. And that wouldn't be a bad tool to have anyway. You want a very powerful one, though, like a gas run one, not some little lightweight, um, you know, battery powered one. You want something with some real ass to it. And uh, if Michael Whitman says something works, I know it works. Commercial producers that do it in large scale, they basically use an upgraded version of this, a, a very big one. They call it a billy goat. And it looks like a water tank that you tow around behind a truck and they have a huge suction thing and they get right in the kilns with it. And so 
you're using the small thing that the big operators use a big thing for. I think that's probably the best way to go. Down there in the corner, those two five-gallon buckets, that's, that's the result of a single burn in my cone kiln after it was crushed. So I'm making, in, in that case, I made almost 10 gallons of char. There was about a gallon in one of the buckets, so I ended up with nine. And I ended up with a gallon of reburn. So, again, it was really back to about a 10-gallon total yield. Um, some people say biochar doesn't work. And, and I need to explain why this is the case, because if you don't understand this, then as you're doing your own research, you're going to fall into a lot of folly. You're going to fall, find a lot of, you know, even published books that say it can ruin your garden or whatever. No, it won't. Um, some of the research, I believe, was intentionally flawed. I don't want to get deep into the politics of this, but there were some people that really, really, really did not want biochar to be a thing when it came out. So much so that you can even find an article on the Permaculture Research Institute's blog, which is, you know, the blog that, that Jeff, Jeff Lawton basically is the lord over that blog and decides what does and doesn't go on there. And in 2010, they published an article about how biochar was not what made Terra Preta, Terra Preta. And we, nobody should use biochar. And if you look at that article now, they didn't take it down. They don't hide what they published. There's an editor's note that basically said, hey, a lot of this stuff's changed. But we're not taking it down because it reflects the view back in, in 2010. Okay, fine. But where did all this come from? This is a disruptive technology. This is disruptive to many things. And, you know, I don't get big on the whole carbon's going to kill us all thing, but this is the best way in the world if you want carbon sequestered to do it. You take that carbon, you put it in the soil, it's there for a thousand years. It's a carbon negative technology. It doesn't do really well to help people get taxed, though. And it, 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 you can't, like, mandate people buy solar panels to do this or what have you. It is a very effective technology. And effective technologies that are decentralized tech are disruptive technologies. And whoever's being disrupted doesn't want to be disrupted. We'll leave it at that. And a lot of the chem ag companies aren't exactly big on this because if you switch to doing this, the other thing you need to do is switch from your chem ag bullshit. And you need to start building living soil. So you can see where this may not be well accepted. There was a whole consortium that came out against this stuff really hard. And one of the books that made this really well known is uh, 1491, America Before Columbus. And when that started, a lot of the people that have been kind of on the sidelines with biochar like jumped in like this is our time. There's an awareness now. So it was pushed back. And this is a pattern that we see in science. So I'll give you an example of a corollary of something that's kind of recent. So there's a doctor and he says, hey, if you use substance A, B, and C, with a patient that has this particular disease early in the illness, my patients have had excellent results from it. And this is very inexpensive stuff. And you can get A, B, and C for almost no money at all. The whole treatment costs about 12 bucks. And there's other pharmaceutical companies and they're making another substance. We'll call it XYZ. And XYZ costs a thousand dollars a pill. And everybody's afraid of this new illness. So there's too much talk about how good this stuff is. So what do you do? You say, we're going to run trials to see if it works. Now, remember, the doctor told you you had to use A, B, and C early in the illness. So you use only A, and you use it late stage in severe stages of the illness that's already progressed. And then you say, hey, it didn't work. This is all bogus. You need to use this other XYZ pill from a company we won't name. And then the sheep all go by and believe it. Yeah. That's an intentionally flawed study. I think most of you know what I'm talking about. I have to do a little bit cryptically so I don't get banned from YouTube again. Um, this is what was done with biochar. They ran trials. They took a field, a dead-ass field that had been chem ag farm forever, and they put fertilizer on one field and they planted plants, and they put biochar on the other field without any fertilizer, and then the biochar field did terrible because it was dead inert soil, and biochar will suck up Nutrient, it will suck up biological activity. It will take it all in like a magnet in the beginning. So if you put it down naked, not charged up, then you're going to have a really bad first year and uh, maybe okay second, and then it will get better by the third. So we don't do that, but that's what they did. 
Like to, then, you know, we fertilized one field with chicken manure and one field filled with bi- well, that doesn't work. And there was a lot of this done intentionally. We have got to inoculate it. And what we're really doing there is not just about charging it up. It's more making it inhabitable. You want soil organisms to be able to live in it. You want the coral reef effect. It is a soil conditioner. It is not fertilizer, though you can turn it into fertilizer. If you soak it with human urine and then dry it out, basically you have a high nitrogen fertilizer, but they didn't do that either. Um, It works best in living soils. It can be part of a chem ag program. It's just that that salt-based fertilization, which is what all these these, these, uh, chemical fertilizers are, it kills off the soil life. So it can't, it can, it can hold in nutrient. It can make things better, but it will never fulfill its potential. And it's probably too expensive to use in a chem ag situation. So it's not going to work there. It needs to be in living soil. It improves with time. Well, what's our time preference in America, in the Western world today? Five minutes, maybe five days, five months if you're lucky, but certainly no more than one season. So if we're trialing this stuff and we're not looking at it five and 10 years into an operation, we're not really understanding what, what it's really doing. Remember, we got soils in the Amazon in the most fragile you know, soils on the planet that are a thousand years old, that are, that are more productive than Midwestern U.S. soils in, in, in the grain belt. But how did they get that way? They didn't get that way overnight. They got that way because people integrated their lifestyle with improving the soil, which is what I'm going to try to teach you to do as we round out today. Um, what type of biochar matters? If you're making biochar from rice hulls, there's nothing wrong with it, but it's not going to look like the two pictures you're looking at. It's not going to have that level of surface area. It's going to add carbon to the soil. It's going to add um, tilth to the soil. It's going to add water retention to the soil. All of those things are good, but it's not going to be the high quality biochar that we get from a woody mass. So that matters too. And again, most of this has been handled. I want to, this is a war that was fought. And for once, the freaking good guys won at a mass level globally. Like it is generally accepted now that biochar works really good if you use it right. But there was a battle that we all missed. At least I didn't know that it happened. I I learned about it later on as I started digging into this. And so know that. So what do we have to do next? We have to, I've used the word inoculation a bunch of times now, and I haven't told you how to do it. I want you to start thinking about how you can integrate it into what you're already doing. That's how Terra Preta was, was, was made. It wasn't like, oh, we want better soil, so we're going to go make biochar. They were making charcoal because they cooked food and they had to control their own stink. And so they integrated those systems together and they built the most fertile soil that the world has ever known. The first step is to wet the char. um, Biochar, one of its unique properties is a pound of biochar can hold seven pounds of water. And if you have a five-gallon bucket of wet char and a five-gallon bucket of dry char and you pick them up, the difference is staggering how much more that five-gallon bucket weighs. It it almost feels like you're holding a bucket of of filled like halfway with water, which is kind of what you're doing. It's just dispersed into this material. And this alone, if this was the only thing biochar did, it would belong in your garden. Okay, because I want you to think about this. One pound holds seven pounds, which means water weighs about 8.3 pounds a gallon. So about 1.2 pounds of biochar can hold a gallon of water. So if we were to go and put a significant amount of biochar into a garden bed, we could easily get it to the point where that garden bed and that soil was capable of holding 100 gallons more water. If you live in a place like Texas or Florida or California, that alone would be it. You'd be done right there. It's worth doing. So we want to wet that char because this only happens after we break the surface tension because dry biochar will float on water. It takes time. Now, what I've noticed when I quench from the, I completely fill that kiln with water and I soak that biochar is never going to be fully dry out again unless I were to lay it out and let it dry out. It gets when it's hot and it happens instantly like that, it goes into the material and it stays damp and it stays wet. And again, unless you let it sit around long enough to fully dry out. Inoculation, if you wanted to use it very soon 
and you didn't have to, you don't have exact some finished compost laying around and you, you're not ready to make compost and you need it i want it now you brew up some compost tea and you inoculate it with compost tea and it's pretty much ready to use right away then uh, I can't go into how to make compost tea in a presentation of this length, but you need to make good compost tea, which means you need good compost. I will tell you a hack for that. Uh, Fox Farm makes really great living soils. They make the uh, Happy Frog and they make another one. I can't food forest or far, forest farm, something like that. Um, there's a lot of life in that potting soil. It is incredibly high quality and most of it is compost. And I will not use very many commercial composts at all, but I will use that to brew compost tea. And I will add things like effective microorganisms to it, or I'm not, I'm sorry, not effective microorganisms, beneficial soil organisms. So beneficial bacteria. And uh, they also make a happy frog fertilizer. It's very low NPK. It's all about the beneficial microorganisms. There's about 30 of them. And you throw a tablespoon of that in with some of that you can make some very good compost tea because i just did this to make up potting soil so i used the same potting soil and just took a little bit of a way to make compost tea out of inoculated the biochar and then it added it back into the rest of the potting soil at about 15 percent by volume and i'm using it to start my seeds this year in my seed starting system so that's your quickest way you can inoculate with human urine there's there's not much to this what they suggest you do is you store the union urine for six months so the pH will change in it, um, but you can also use it immediately as well. And you basically soak it so it's not a soppy mess, but it's wet with urine, and you, you keep doing that so you have as much as you want, and then you want to set it out and you do want to let it really dry so that you're not using a wet urine in your garden, and that's about a 15-part uh, nitrogen fertilizer. It's like a 15-2-2 fertilizer. And that's very quick to do as well. The best way, I believe, is included in the compost process. So you want to add biochar to your compost pile as you're building your compost pile. Uh, part of a composting toilet solution, that system, that would, that would take care of as well. Passing it through livestock. When your chicken, your duck, your goat, your pig eats biochar, when it poops out, it's, the inoculation is taken care of. And if that's being backfed into your composting system, so much the better. Include it in your livestock bedding. That we talked about earlier, it will reduce the stink in your, in your, your house, your chicken house or what have you. But it's going to end up in your compost passively. Again, how do, you, how do you take this and make it additive, not replacement as something on your homestead? Um, add it to completed compost. If you have compost that you've made and... You, you didn't have biochar when you made it, but now you've got your compost. You add it to your compost, let it sit for about three weeks before you apply it to your garden. And you'll be in good shape that way as well. You can purchase it pre-inoculated. There's a lot of manufacturers who, who make biochar now and sell it and ship it. And most of them will not sell what they call naked char. And the reason they don't want to do that is what I went through with you about how they created these flawed studies. They're afraid their customer won't understand it no matter how many times they say it. And, you know, Susie Homemaker with all her rose bushes buys this fancy biochar shit. She throws it all over the place around her rose bushes and her rose bushes do worse than they ever have. The fact that three years from now, she'll probably have the greatest roses on the block doesn't matter. She's angry. So they sell it pre-inoculated. And one of the great things about biochar, it's actually difficult to brew up good microorganisms and transport them to another place. They tend to die very quickly. They need oxygen. So they either have to be kind of in an inert state or they have to be highly oxygenated or they have to be in a stable dry state. Otherwise they'll die because they're alive. They need to eat. They need to breathe. They need to poop. They need to do what living things do. They need to reproduce. So when you buy a jug of some shit, some liquid, and it's supposed to have, you know, beneficial soil microbes in it. Now, if they're anaerobes, if it's like um, effective microbes, which are a, more of a fermentation type of thing, they can live in there. But your aerobic soil organisms, and you have a jug of liquid, and it's supposed to have all these beneficial soil bacteria and fungi in it, they might be in there, dead. When you make compost tea, you put 
air stones in the bottom of a bucket and you ha hang basically a tea bag, a big bag full of compost in your vessel and you plump air through it. You shut that pump off and within 30 minutes, you're starting to have death in there. But if we inoculate biochar, they get in those little apartments. They're protected. UV light kills these critters too. So they have a little house that they can stay in. As long as there's a little bit of food, they can exist a lot longer. So you can buy pre-inoculated char. Or if you're really great at brewing things like compost teas, you might have a side hustle here just inoculating char and selling it to gardening neighbors. Because it's the best way to move microorganisms. So it's the best way to get microorganisms that are really healthy and active onto land that's not already got them. As long as people are doing proper growing practices and they're not going to kill them in other ways. Um, but yeah, that's a really great way to do things. Uh, and use it in worm bins. It, you can just, now you want really finely crushed biochar for your worm bins. But if you're doing this anyway, you're not going to put all your biochar into your worm bins, right? So what you do is you get a finer screen, you take your final product and you just run it across that screen and you get, you know, maybe a gallon or so. And then every time you add food to your worm bins, throw a couple tablespoons in there. Now you're making a worm casting that is inoculated with biochar. And you can combine these things. It's so powerful what you can do with this. And we're, again, today I'm an hour and 20 minutes in. I have only scratched the surface of what we can do with this. But I want you to realize how easy this is to integrate. The picture you're looking at there is a modified version of Johnson Sioux composting. And um, right behind it is my, my chicken and duck house. Just to the right of it, you can kind of see some cinder blocks there where there's a little black tub. This is what I'm doing now that I've discovered biochar. I have straw bales that I and wood chips that I use in my, my, my duck house. Every time I'm like, yeah, it's about time for another layer of carbon. I take a five gallon bucket of finished biochar, I spread it out on the floor in the coop, and then I add the next layer of carbon. Some of it's going to get eaten. A lot of it's going to get left there, right? Most of it's going to get left there. It's going to suck up duck poop and duck pee and chicken poop and chicken pee and goose, goose poop and pee. And it's going to be there when I make my next batch of compost. The little center block wall over there, that's where I do all my crushing of biochar. Any that gets spilled, it gets spilled in there. They're going to eat it. They're going to go through there. They're going to incorporate it. They're going to poop on it. When I make my compost, I take material from that, that, that pit with the cinder blocks around it and all the material from the duck house. They go into these bio digesters, basically, is what they are. The Johnson Sioux method of composting. And uh, that's it. Now I have, you know, compost that's going to be about 10% to 15% biochar, maybe more, depending on how much I'm able to make this year. The next season goes into my garden. I don't have to actually do anything other than make the char and throw it into this system. And at the other side of it, I'm also feeding it to them. So every day I go out, I feed them about a five, half a five gallon bucket full of feed. That's how much my flock gets. And I have an end cap for four inch pipe, PVC pipe. It just happened to be there. It looked about the right amount. So every day when I fill up a five, a half a five gallon bucket full of duck food, which is their, their, their feed that we have custom milled uh, plus uh, one big scoop of black oil sunflower seed, I take a biochar bucket that sits right next to it and I scoop out the biochar and I dump that in there and take a shovel and stir up and I pour it into their feet and they eat it. And so now when they're pooping all night long, when they're in the house, they're adding biochar infused poop. And when they're pooping outside, they're spreading biochar around my property. There's nothing about that that's hard work. There's nothing about that that requires brewing compost tea or anything complicated. And long term, that's where I want to be with this. I'm doing some accelerated things with compost tea and whatnot this year because I don't have uh, a bunch of finished compost right now to work with. And the compost that I'm making won't be ready for another couple months. So because the method I use takes a little longer, but it's like no work. How do we get it in the soil? Well, again, we apply it with seasonal compost. So most good organic gardeners and organic farmers are making compost or sourcing good quality compost. And at least once a season, when they go to plant, they're laying down another layer of compost and building the carbon in the soil. So that's, if we do what I just said, that's all we have to do. We're going to put it in. We can spot apply urine biochar. So remember it's high nitrogen. So your heavy feeders like peppers and tomatoes, 
If you have biochar that's been, you know, inoculated with human urine, then you can spread that around or just in the hole when you plant it. And basically now that's going to be there. It's going to be an initial nitrogen hit, but it's going to over time give up that nitrogen, take up soil organisms and become part of that coral reef system that we're building. Use it in your seed starting mix like I'm doing so that every transplant you set out, you're adding biochar. And every year you're doing it again and you're doing it again. And you're since you're doing a transplant with maybe a four inch deep root ball, you're digging a four inch hole, you're building vertically and horizontally in the soil. Again, establishing more and more of those coral reefs. Trenches in your garden. Think about it this way. Why advantage the weeds in your garden rather than just apply it initially anyway where your plants are going to go? So where we're going to have a line that we're going to plant in a garden, go ahead and trench that out and take your composted compost and biochar mixture and fill the trench with it and then backfill the trench and then go ahead and plant your plants. Now, next season, maybe do your 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 pattern of trenches horizontally across like a patchwork. And then maybe the next season at an angle. And eventually you'll have the entire garden that you've built up with all of that coral reef activity. Uh, you might till it in. Uh, that would be something I would say, you know, I'm a big on no till. So like first time only you can moat around trees. If you, that's actually uh, Kenya uh, biochar project there where they taught the people how to make biochar with very low tech mechanisms, like digging a pit. You can basically dig a cone shaped pit in the ground. So a shovel is all you need in a flame and material. And what they're doing there, they have an existing tree. So they go out to where the drip line is. That's where the canopy of the tree is. They dig a shallow trench and they take compost and biochar mixed together and they fill the trench and then they mulch the whole thing. So that's a way to get it into like if you have an existing orchard or something like that and to move a little bit quicker with getting it into the ground. You can add it when you're growing a cover crop. So I think that's probably your best bet if you do cover cropping. Uh, that's when you would throw your cover crop seed down then apply a layer of compost and biochar. And then when that cover crop comes up, you're going to get an instant hit of, um, of kind of a nutrient load up from that interaction with the cover crop. Now, again, we want inoculated composted biochar, but what you need to understand about soil life, the plants need the soil bacteria and fungi. But the soil bacteria and fungi, to be successful long-term, need the plants. It is a symbiotic relationship. If you have soil with nothing growing in it for long enough, your soil life begins to die. It needs, I would say all of it, but much of it begins to die. Or it goes inert. There's an exchange that goes on called the exudate process, where these soil organisms literally exchange with the plants. They give the plant something and the plant gives them something. In general, what the plant gives the soil organisms is sugar. That's why when we make compost tea, we generally use some um, horticultural molasses. We need some sugar in there since there's not a plant in there for these soil organisms to be able to feed upon, to, to reproduce, to make babies, to, to multiply. Because we do when we make compost tea, we're taking a small amount of life and making a big amount of life with it. And for that to happen naturally on an ongoing basis, soil needs root systems of living plants that take carbon out of the atmosphere, right? They off-gas oxygen. But the other thing they're doing is they're, every plant is a giant solar-powered factory. And it's converting solar energy into woody mass and leaf mass. And it's making sugars. And it will give up some of its own sugar to form that relationship. So we want to make sure that we're applying this stuff with plant-based systems. Uh, it will do much better that way. You can broad fork it. A broad fork is a great big pitchfork looking thing. And it's a great alternative to tilling to loosen up soil before planting. And so you stick this thing in the ground. You usually have two handles and you just rock it back and forth. And then you move it a few inches forward and you do it again. You go through your whole garden or your planting rows on a small farm that way. Um, Low-tech redneck, good quality pitchfork. Not the real thin ones that we use for pitching straw or hay, but the ones with thicker, you can just poke those into the ground. So you can apply your compost and, and biochar and broad fork or fork it in without actually turning the soil over to get more down into the soil. And again, in time, this won't matter because worms and soil organisms and everything else will distribute this stuff throughout your whole soil. Uh, and again, when you're setting out transplants that you've been producing using biochar 
And there's some pretty good results that come from doing that. Uh, you're also seeding biochar every time you put out a transplant. For me, from now on, for the rest of my life, every single seed that I start in a cup or a pot that will be planted out will have some biochar in it, one way or another. Once it's in the soil, what does it do? Well, people have asked me about this since I started talking about it. It may slightly raise your pH. And the reality is I don't believe that it raises pH because it's alkaline itself. I don't think that's how it works. And the science I've looked at says that's probably not what's going on. So in many parts of the world, soils are very acidic and they are acidic to the point where it's detrimental to most of the plants that we want to grow. Certain plants like blueberries like acidic soils, but most plants don't want acidic soil. So this is generally considered a benefit. But what I think is happening is by improving the soil biology, over time, acidic soils become more alkaline. If you put biochar into your soil at any reasonable amount that anybody would be capable of doing or be able to afford to do, and your soil pH dramatically increases rapidly without biological activity being the explanation, I would say that you had biochar that had an awful lot of fly ash on it, and it's the ash that did it. Biochar by itself, according to Michael Whitman, who's probably the most switched on guy I know in, in the world for this stuff is barely a buffer in the soil pH. So I think, again, what's going on is that acidic soils are moving more toward the alkaline because we're improving the biology in the soil. And soil, like perfect soil, would be somewhere right around a 7, like a 7.2 to a 6.8 to a 7. My soils are quite alkaline, but I don't perceive that I'm going to have any like higher alkalinity in my soil. I actually may in time move more acidic as I improve my soil biology and you create more humus because humus equals humic acid. So I, I, I would say that this may happen, but it's not something that's really of a huge concern. It will provide a home for the microbes we've been talking about. So we get more active biological life in our soil. We're creating, again, I want you to always think about that. Biochar is to the soil is coral is to the sea. It is the place where life can attach itself and then life begats more life. It becomes a reserve for nutrients. So when we do fertilize, whether it's with compost or whether it's with organic fertility or whatever, what happens inevitably is a lot of the nitrogen, the phosphorus, the potassium, and many of the other micro and macronutrients that we add to our soils, we get a big rain event. A lot of it washes out. With biochar, we're holding it in the soil longer period, which is why when people say, well, it works in the tropics, but it's not worth doing in the Midwest. or there. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, if it's a reserve for nutrients, a home for microbes, and holds seven times its weight in water, I think it works everywhere. Now, the effect, the, the yield increase may be higher if you're starting out with shitty acidic soils in the tropics. It may do more from the get-go, but it does well everywhere. And again, seven times its weight in water. Seven times its weight in water. So again... Uh, you know, you're talking about something like 100 and, 120 pounds of biochar should hold almost 100 gallons of water. So if, uh, over time in your garden, you added 120 pounds of charged up biochar. You've increased the capacity for water retention in your garden by 100 gallons. That, that's kind of insane of itself. It increases cat, cation exchange and anion exchange. I don't want to get deep into that. I'm not a soil scientist. But what I mean by that is there's a capacity for soil to retain and exchange nutrient. And our, again, I've said this before, but our native soils in our prairie regions were somewhere in the, the, the high 20s, mid 30s. This was the, the incredibly fertile soil that the first settlers found, and they almost couldn't help but grow amazing crops until they mined those soils down over time. Now there's a lot of farms in the country that used to have those native prairie soils that have a cation exchange of two or four. And if you have a two and you go to a four, woohoo! I mean, you've done a lot to get that done. A lot of farms have really increased their cation exchange over time by adding organic matter in the form of compost and humus and good cover cropping and root mass, et cetera. But it takes a long time with organic practices to take a place from like a four to like an eight. That's a home run. And there's a lot of really great organic farms that are eight, 10, 12 cation exchange capacity. 
One of the uh, videos in the workshop that I, I have for you, incredibly sandy, very low cation exchange soils and intensive management with just a few seasons of biochar. They're up in like 26, 28, something like that. So they're approaching native, native prairie soils and they're in freaking North Carolina, sandy North Carolina soil. Again, the, uh, the cation exchange capacity of some of the Amazonian uh, terra preta is over 200. Pure, pure organic matter, I think it tops out at like 400. The anti-exchange is very a, a similar thing with some different nutrients that uh, have a different charge. And it's not as strong as the, the CEC. The AEC is not as strong, but it's there. So simple explanation. It will improve the ability of your plants to exchange nutrients with soil organisms. So most of our soils, they literally have everything you need to grow. There's enough manganese. There's enough calcium. There's enough of everything in there, but the plants can't get to it. And this will improve the ability for the soil to keep it and for them to obtain it. And the way I teach to build soil is, over time, fertility over time, is, is build, hold, increase. That's the way I've simplified that. You start out with soil in most places, it's going to be crap. So you have to build the fertility first and you have to increase it every year. That's the only way that you end up getting into that fantastic production capacity that home gardens that are run by organic practices and permaculture practices are known for. But if you're building increasing without holding, then, then you're kind of spinning your wheels. So I've always been looking for ways to improve the holding capacity of the soil. And that's the real magic here because it's permanent. There's an expense. Yes. There's a cost. Yes. There's labor. Yes. But every time you do it, whatever you've done, you've done for your lifetime and your kid's lifetime and your grandchildren's lifetime and their grandchildren's lifetime and their grandchildren's lifetime. We're back to seventh generational thinking with this stuff. We're at actually more like hundred generational thinking when we're doing this. It, that, that's what we're talking about here. We're really changing things for the better. It will also, of course, increase carbon content. If you're putting pure carbon in your soil, you're going to have more carbon. Um, carbon farming is organic farming. The, there is, there's no such thing as soil with too much carbon in it. No one's ever complained about that ever happening. Uh, it also binds up toxins. And this is where we get into adsorb versus absorb. Absorb is what a sponge does to water. And depending on what we're talking about, biochar both absorbs and adsorbs. It certainly absorbs water like a sponge, but it adsorbs nutrients, including toxic nutrients. And it does this through an electro electromagnetic type process where literally the, the substance is attracted like a magnet and sticks and binds to the side of this charcoal. Now, you might think, well, isn't this bad? Because if I have something in my soil that I really don't want to consume and it gets adsorbed by the biochar, it stays there. It stays there, but it stays there in a manner which is inert. Because now the plant or the, or the soil bacterium or the fungi would need to work to break the, the connection, to break the bond. It would take energy to get it. Yeah. Well, it's not going to put energy into getting something it doesn't need or want. It's not, your plant is not going to make a symbiotic relationship with a soil microorganism and then say, hey, I want cadmium. It's not going to do that. So if we start using this and we bind up any of the, that's how we can remediate soils and then be able to grow in them. Most methods of soil remediation, what you have to do, you remediate the soil and then you take the remediating agent and you remove it, and then you have a pile of toxin you have to get rid of somewhere somehow. That's, that's how most soil remediation has worked up till now. With biochar, we simply lock it up and make it inert. And there, there, there is probably nothing of, you know, short of like a Chernobyl-type thing that can't be remediated with biochar. Um, and again, it promotes seed germination. And it, real quick, again, on the wood vinegar, this is like the hack used in Asian farming that just has never made it to America. It's even hard to find good quality wood vinegars in America, but it's a very small amount to the, to the liter or to the gallon that's necessary uh, to do this. And again, it's also a good 
uh, pest deterrent. So again, uh, blue sky biochar soil is a great wood bamboo, uh, bamboo wood vinegar. Uh, that's what I'm going to be using this year. The results, though, I think sometimes an image is a better way to go. And if you look on the right of your screen right now, what you see there are eggplant starts. The ones in the back had inoculated biochar. The ones in the front were planted in the exact same soil. Just no biochar. Same mix. The only difference was the ones in the back had a 10% by volume addition of biochar. That's pretty evident. And then the, the one in the bottom, this is from New England Biochar's website. Those are turnips. They're like the size of bowling balls, and they work around with biochar. And there's been plenty of trials. You can look that up for yourself now, side-by-side -side comparison. Does it do this for everything in every situation? No. There are some things that maybe it doesn't really work well for, especially early on. Alliums like garlic and onions apparently are not completely in love with this whole process. Um, so if we had a dedicated allium bed, maybe you just stick to standard uh, practices or maybe, you know, you wait until you're a few years into a management practice and then try that again and see if then it makes sense to start moving it into other things, but almost everything else. And it can create some nutrient deficiencies. So one of the living web farms uh, workshops I have, a guy talks about how when they first applied it, it was well inoculated and all, but I guess they didn't have any form of calcium in the inoculation and there wasn't much calcium in the soil that they were working with. And so it created a calcium deficiency and the, the squash that they grew grew like crazy. And each plant made more squash than he'd ever seen a plant individual plant make, but they were little and they would only get to a certain size and they would get blossom end rot and they would die. Now he said, if you were selling for us uh, into restaurant space, you would actually want to cause this to happen if you could replicate it. Because chefs would look the little baby squashes, like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them per plant. Um, so that was a problem turning into a solution if you looked at it the right way. But just know there are some things we're still learning that can maybe not quite work out the way you had planned. But I think the overall balance is, is just really great. You don't really need to worry about anything that's on here. I just wanted to talk a little bit about it. So I have this slide for myself. Every single link on this slide is available on my website, the survivalpodcast.com forward slash biochar. Um, but there are three workshops from Living Web, Web Farms. Some of them were done in conjunction with Bob Wells of New England Biochar on biochar inoculation, the what, why, and how, farm scale biochar. Those three workshops alone are probably 25 hours of, of on site workshop stuff. Like this is like their students went there to learn and they videoed it. They are very well done. There is one discussion in one of the three playlists that's inside the greenhouse. It's fascinating, but there's a little bit of audio issues at some points where you can't really hear the guy over some of the equipment running and all. That's a very minor piece of it. The rest of it is very well done. And it's a big part of why I know what I know now. And I'm sharing it with you. Then I have some other videos like the hookway retort in action. Uh, one done by an Asian gentleman called Eight Low Cost Ways to Make Biochar. I included that because the things like the barrel and what have you, a lot of times you could tell a person, but if they see it, then they feel more comfortable doing it. He does a good job with that. I've got some of my podcasts on there. On the one on the site, I actually have some new podcasts. I've got the website where I bought my kiln. I'm not saying to buy one because there's other ways to do this, but if you want one like I have, uh, they have those available. Blue Sky Biochar. I really recommend you look at Michael's site. Uh, he, po the podcast he did with me was excellent. New England Biochar, that's the source of a lot of this information. And the U.S. Biochar Initiative. So this has gotten accepted by the same people that tried to kill it. So now there are organizations trying to set standards for this because now it's actually seen as a carbon sink. So, for instance, right now, Microsoft alone, because they created this carbon trading scheme, they have a bid out to buy over the next years, uh, next 10 years, more biochar than exists. There's not enough being produced to fill one order from one megacorp. So that, that tells you there's an economic opportunity here eventually as well. It's also something that could get out of hand. So we have to keep an eye on that. But that doesn't mean we can't use it in our own backyard. But I see getting to a point where a small farm, somebody that's farming two, three, five, ten 10 acres, could make biochar, make heat as a byproduct, make all these great products, use the biochar to improve their own soil. But since it's permanent, eventually get to a point where like, we really don't need it here anymore. 
And then they could be able to sell to home gardeners, small farmers, et cetera, who don't want to do that work themselves. And if they had a surplus that they just didn't have a market for right now, they would have a commodity sale into this market as well, as long as they kept good records and it met the standards required to meet this. So there's a tremendous amount of kind of forward movement on it. And again, you can learn more and connect at the survivalpodcast.com forward slash biochar. That page is already up. I published it right before I began this. I'm going to go ahead and take some questions now. There's about 13 of them. This went quicker than I thought. It was long, but I thought that might take me two and a half hours instead of an hour and 45. Um, here's one from Bill. Bill says, have you tried biochar as a wicking medium? And what I was explaining in the chat, that, that one came in before we even started, is I haven't, but I will. <laughs> Anything that can uphold 7X its weight in water and light and soil at the same time would be a good wicking medium if he means it the way that I think he means it. And so when, when I do a wicking bed, the bottom is going to be something like lava rock or coarse sand or something. And then there's going to be a, a barrier, two layers of high-end weed blocking material. Then I put about an inch and a half to two inches of perlite there. I don't think that I will replace the perlite with biochar at that level because I don't know that it would be that beneficial long-term. I think it could do more good up in the soil column and the perlite's much less expensive than the biochar. Even though I'm making my own, there's a value to it. Then I make a mix of high quality compost and soil and lighteners. And usually I use perlite as a lightener in that soil, or I use something like expanded shale. I have some wicking beds that need to be relocated. And that means that they're going to have to be dug out and redone. And I plan on adding about 10% by volume of biochar to the soil profile for multiple reasons, but as a wicking agent, certainly, and as a moisture retentive uh, thing as well. And those are already have very mature soils in them. So I expect that the, uh, the, the cooperation between the biochar and the soil organisms will go really, really fast with those. Um, Bill says, would there be any advantage to aerate the reservoir of the wicking bed? No, not really. It, you could do it. It won't hurt anything, but um, it's really not the kind of thing that you would benefit from because your soil in a wicking bed has to be light by nature. There's no oxygen problems in a well-designed wicking bed uh marco argon says can biochar reduce the algae sludge in my aquaponics system yeah but why would it do that so the reason it would do that is it would take up so much nutrient that your algae wouldn't have much nutrient which means plants wouldn't have much nutrient and at the point where it stopped doing that where it was like fully charged up and the plants could grow again, then the algae would grow again. So you, you have an algae problem, not a biochar deficiency problem. So here's my thing with aquaponics systems. When somebody has an algae problem with aquaponics, they either don't have an algae problem or they have one very simple to fix. So if you have some algae in your fish tank where the fish live, I don't think you have a problem with algae. It's not going to hurt anything. Don't worry about it. If, unless you're getting string algae that's, that's clogging up your system, it's okay. It's no big deal. I have algae in all my aquatic systems, and I don't care. Now, if you have green water, that can be a little bit different of an issue, but a barley straw bale will knock that rate out 95% of the time, one or two barley straw bales. If you have algae where your plants are growing, like in an ebb and flow bed, you need to lower the level that the water comes to in your ebb and flow bed. The top of your ebb and flow system where your leka is or whatever you're using as a media should always be dry. It should never be wet. There's no need for it to be wet. You put the plant roots down a couple inches into the uh, material. <coughs> From there, they keep growing, right? They keep going deeper and deeper and deeper. So they don't. you don't need water at the surface. If you're doing something like... Uh, a deep water system where you're raft growing or something like that, the plant can still be up high enough that you're not sopping wet on the top. So algae needs two things, light, actually three things, light, nutrient, and moisture. So if you dry up the area, 
you're going to have a lot less of a problem. And I'm going to keep switching back and forth for other questions. So remember, keep using all caps for me. When, I'm, when I don't have a guest and I'm doing it myself, it's easy for me to miss your questions. Uh, somebody said, though, you know, I, I look there, it's shrimp deficiency. Yeah, shrimp will eat a lot of your algae for you. I'll tell you what else eats string algae is crayfish. Crayfish eat the hell out of string algae. I had a, I have a small pond back in my aviary, and it's made out of a 250-gallon, 11-inch uh, deep uh, chemical spill catch tray. That's about four foot by six foot, I think, in, in dimensions. And it was full of string algae. And I threw like a couple dozen crawfish in there. It was maybe three weeks. There was hardly any string algae left. They ate it all. That's the, uh, I'm not sure they ate it. I just don't have another explanation. And as soon as the crawfish were gone, the algae came back. Uh, Grumpy Green Guy says, think it could be used as a disposable compostable hydrogen alternative in aquaponics. Might be answered, but I'll probably lose interest during the live feed. Okay. I'll lose internet. Okay. Like, that's kind of insulting. Lose interest. No, lose internet. Okay. That makes sense. So you can use it in aquaponics. It is a nutrient magnet, though. And if you think about a standard ebb and flow bed, say a 20-gallon bed, that's a lot of biochar. It's a massive amount of surface area. It is going to take all the nutrients for quite a while before that battery is topped up in a system like that. So instead of a disposable, compostable hydrogen, it doesn't need to be compost once you've done this. And it certainly doesn't need to be disposed of. It needs to go into soil-based systems. So could you do it? Yes. How well will it work? I don't know. If you fully charge it up with good compost tea before you use it, will it work in an aquaponic system and not take away all the nutrients because it's already charged up? I don't know. What I do know is this. I have an aquatic system that I do some aquaponics in, but I can put as much waste in it as the thing needs because I dump duck excrement straight into it with a tank system on gravity and I only add waste to it at times it makes sense and and that way I just stop discharging that waste there and I discharge it directly to trees uh in the summer so in the summer maybe two days a week the duck waste will go into the pond system this is a pretty big pond system overall it's about 3,000 gallons I have some tanks on the back of that that are in a kind of a shady area and so what I'm thinking is I might build a little 20 gallon uh, irrigation tray ebb and flow bed and just fill it up with crushed biochar, not even try to grow anything in it and then just run it for two or three weeks at a time and then take it out of that system. And then it's really charged up and ready to go. That might be a quick way to charge it up. Overall, I don't think it's going to be a great aquaponics medium. If you're doing that though, you're constantly reusing it. I think what would work best for an aquaponics medium would be a biochar made out of a very durable material uh, like walnut shells would be in it, but it's jude long. Yeah. You burned it all off. Relax. We've, we've done this already. Um, like black walnut uh, shell media might be a really great biochar to use in an aquaponics system. It's going to take a long time to charge up, but once it does, it's permanent. And so it might be a good long-term replacement in those systems instead of a short duration thing where you're looking for the filtration because it is, it, it will absolutely just hammer that nutrient load. Um, now, if you, if you go and what was I, I lost it there for a second. I'm going to go on. I don't know what I was going to say there. Uh, Bill says, what percentage of terra preta soil was biochar? There's not a fixed answer to that because it's different everywhere. But in a lot of cases, you know, there's as much as 15, 20% of topsoil that is, is pure carbon. In some of these places, there's almost as much pottery shard mixed in with it. In other places, it varies. And there is also terra mulata. So there's not just one type of soil in these systems. So where this was done very intensively, you have this terra preta where it's very deep. It will be 18 inches to as much as two meters deep and jet black. And then the terra mulata will generally be further out where it was less intensively managed with chop and char versus chop and burn. And these soils are much darker 
than the native soils, but they have a much lower carbon content, but they're still very, very productive. They're not as productive. Uh, that's the best answer I can give on you. And remember, I'm not an expert on this. I'm doing my best. Uh, Jack, question from Eka Mouse. One pound of biochar can hold 1.1 gallons of water. Is that right or seems unreal? Uh, not quite. I think it's more like 1.1 to 1.2 pounds of biochar could hold uh, about one gallon of water. Because at seven times its weight, a pound would hold seven pounds, right? So, and then obviously different chars might be a little less efficient at that, but that's a pretty well accepted number. So it's close to that. And it is almost unreal. And when you, again, all you have to do is wet some biochar and put two amounts equal by volume in a container, two different containers that are the same weight and pick it up. And you can verify it for yourself very, very quickly uh, just with a, with a simple feel uh, test. You can certainly weigh it as well. But, yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing the amount of water it can retain. Uh, K-Monk says, quench from the bottom. Are there benefits? Any reason to reserve the charcoal water? Not really. I mean, it's got some st growth stimulants in it or what have you. Um, honestly, ours just runs out on the ground right now. I mean, uh, I know some people are really big on, like, they have to use every drop of water efficiently, man. Well, it's going on the ground, and my ducks are going to make mud and have fun, and it's going to grow in the grass. Um, I do think it makes sense, <clears throat> excuse me, to, if you design a kiln, where you can really quench from the bottom, like I talked about doing with the 55-gallon drum. And some of the pyramid kilns have a fitting like I talked about already. They have a pipe with a with a hose bib on the end of the pipe. And that's where I came up with the idea. It's not an original idea. And they push water into the bottom. If you can do that, like I said, then you could disconnect the other end of the hose and go ahead and use that water. There's no reason not to use it. But I don't know that it is going to be particularly beneficial water in any real way other than by bringing some of the residues that were remaining with it, you would have kind of the same total somewhat of a stimulative effect that wood vinegar does, but I don't think anywhere near at the same level. Uh, next, Texas Homestead. Does biochar raise or lower, lower soil typical pH when applied directly? Seems to be differing opinions. I think I explained that pretty well, and I think that there's a reason why, and that is that it is alkaline. It's highly alkaline when you first make it, and then its alkalinity declines over time. It will always be somewhat toward the alkaline side. One of the reasons we need to wet it is that starts the process of bringing the alkalinity down. We want to compost it. We want to, you know, composting has acids in it. That's going to bring the alkalinity down. And we're doing that not because we're worried about raising soil pH. We're doing that because if the pH of the biochar is too high, then the soil organisms don't want to live in it. It's toxic to them if it's too high. So it's more of that case. I don't personally believe that it does much to soil pH. And the reason I don't believe that is because Michael Whitman says it doesn't. And I have yet to find somebody that's done more research and has more hands-on experience uh, than him. I found some equal but none with more and none with equal or even close that disagree with what he's saying. So again, I think that what it can do though is raise soil pH. If you have crappy acidic soil across time, as you improve its biology, it's going to raise in pH. I think if you have fairly alkaline soil, it was barely a buffer. It's not going to do much. So I think there's a way that you can have two people, not necessarily a rigged study, they get very dis 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 disparagent results. And if you're having any perception bias going into that, you can lead you to improper conclusions without it necessarily being nefarious. Uh, that's my best on that one. Living free in Tennessee, Nicole Sauces. We have a redneck engineers in the holler. Well, I think it'd be a good one to look at. The simpler one is that little attachment for a 55-gallon drum, though, Nicole, if you're still here. K-Bonk says, I have been having trouble finding 55 gallon metal drums, get them when you can. I think that's highly, highly location specific on that. I think that uh, depending on where you live, you might find it easier or harder to get them. They're pretty easy to get here right now. Uh, 229 mix said, could you do a brief functional comparison between what Google culture does versus biochar? They seem to have at least some same benefits. I think a comparison might help you understand both better. N not really. They're totally dispargent things. They're not related in any way. They certainly could be combined. Hugo culture 
takes woody mass, puts it into a pile, and it's a slow compost, which means over time, the vast majority of the carbon in that woody mass goes back into the atmosphere. It is not permanently sequestered. Again, making compost creates a lot of carbon that goes back into the atmosphere. Methane as well. One of the things I didn't talk about, and I should have, is that when you're making compost, not only can you put biochar in the compost, you can cap your compost pile with biochar. And so a lot of that off gas that would normally go in the atmosphere will get absorbed by the biochar. This isn't that important if you're mixing biochar in your compost, but as you start taking from your compost pile, you can cap it every time you do it with more biochar and continue the inoculation process. If you're not going to use all your compost at once, but hugel culture is what it actually means. Everybody thinks it means the wood core. The wood core is just a common thing. You have this extra wood. I got to get rid of it. It has no value. Now it has a value. Now it has a value of biochar because that's what it was. It was low value timber. And a farmer needed, and so it's called, it's hill culture. So a lot of hugel culture that we think of in the U.S. being wood core, there's a, I, I've seen Seb Holcher build hugels with no wood mass. It just happens to be one of the things you do. And what you're really doing is you're making a compost. And what no one talks about with hugel culture and, and Seb Holcher is what Seb Holcher eventually does with a hugel mound. They builds a terrace, he builds a bunch of hugels on it, he starts farming them, and eventually they get spread out and you're doing a more conventional cultivation. That's what eventually happens. You've made, you know, maybe millions of dollars worth of soil in a slow process. Biochar is a totally different thing. So they're just not really related. They just don't do the same thing. Uh, K Bonk says, is biochar good filtration medium for water? Yes, it is. I think we've kind of covered that. Um, when you want to filter water though, like, you really want to filter it to make it safe for human consumption. You want to use something called activated carbon. And it's basically a biochar that's gone through a very intense steam purification process. You know what I talk about filtering or steam, you know, quenching from the bottom. It's that, but it's done at, in a very quality controlled way. And that is going to be much more effective for filtering water. You also want finer particle sizes for doing things like that. But you could use biochar in a multi-stage filtration system for water and make it very, very pure. Uh, Ecomouse says, Jack, he, he, hemp plus biochar to leach the heavy metals from radioactive site. Wondering if biochar along the banks of the Ohio River Basin would help their situation. It might. I don't know. It certainly couldn't hurt it. It certainly couldn't hurt it. Do we have any more? Because I'm worn out, guys. That was, uh... no, we got one. Maybe I missed it, but how to make wood vinegar run gas through a condenser on your still instead of a gas fire generator. So I don't know the process really well, but it is pretty much you take the, the, the this, this, what would normally be like the smoke coming off of the fire and you put it through a distillation process. It goes through a condenser pipe that cools it down and a liquid distillate comes out. People do this. There are people that make their own liquid smoke. Um, some people make liquid smoke while they're running uh, their grill. They're, they're like a sidebox smoker or whatever. I've never done it, uh, but it's not that hard. But most of the types of kilns that we use at the backyard level don't really lend themselves to it. But it's done all over the world, and it's been done for thousands of years, so you can do it. But it's what it is, is it's condensing the, the, the smoke back into a distillate. Uh, and it comes out as liquid smoke. Now, my understanding is you shouldn't be doing that really – uh, with certain things, if you're going to consume it, uh, the I believe the FDA regulations are that any liquid smoke made for human consumption uh, needs to come from a fruiting wood. So you know, apple, cherry. But if you think about like what what do we smoke meat with? Hickory, oak. Right? We don't think of nuts as fruits, but it would fall under a fruiting wood, right? So, uh, but I don't know really much about that. And uh, anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. I really did. It was a uh, it was really a, a great episode to do. And it's helped me learn more. And it's helped me by sharing this stuff with you guys over the last month and getting your questions to put it together. So thank you for that. Again, I do have this Web page up for you, the survivalpodcast.com uh, biochar with tons of additional information. Uh, so anything I didn't answer, you probably can learn from there. And I will be adding to this uh, going forward in the future. If you like the show and the work that we do, 
do consider supporting us by by uh, doing your online shopping starting at tspaz.com. My item of the day fits right with this topic, GS Plant Foods Liquid Kelp Fertilizer. When I inoculate my biochar, I always, if I'm doing it with compost tea, I include this because it has so many minerals and nutrients in it that that biochar is able to take up. So that compost tea I talked about making to inoculate biochar for my potting mix, I included some of this. You can read the write-up. I've gone long already today, but GS Plant Foods Liquid Kelp. Liquid Kelp is one of the dynamite secrets to my ongoing fertility program. So it's something definitely we're checking out. And hey, if you want to look good, hey, you just listen to this uh, presentation. And it's so easy to understand if you work at it. Even a redneck hippie duck farmer like me can figure it out. Maybe you're a redneck hippie duck farmer too. You can get your redneck hippie duck farmer shirts at tspswag.com. We have tons of different uh, items there. This just happens to be one of my favorite. Uh, you can see that we have tons of shirts available. We have the big bring back seventh generational thinking uh, shirt that I'm wearing today. Uh, we've got a whole slew of stuff that's on the Bitcoin breakout side of things. TSP merchandise, mugs, tumblers, hats, accessories, all kinds of cool stuff available. You should probably see them if you're on YouTube right down there below the video. You can see all the different cool stuff, including the uh, Bitcoin breakout Val mugs. Those are pretty cool, too. Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed it today. I will be back tomorrow with an expert council Q&A show. I really hope that uh, the work that I put into the shows, this was not something like a lot of times you guys, I know uh, you might think that I have hours and hours into a show. And I guess in my past, you know, life accumulation of knowledge, I, I do. But a lot of times I'll get up in the morning and I will put together a show an hour before uh, I make the announcement of what it's going to be about. And two hours later, I'm, I'm presenting. This was not that. This was two months of intense research and just the deck alone was a week and a half of work. And, and I hope that came through today. And even though it, it probably won't be the best version of it I ever do, uh, it was the first time through and you, you tend to get things better at things and learn from things as you go. Uh, I hope it I hope it was good enough that you feel like had I paid 25 bucks for a virtual seminar on this, I would have gotten my money's worth. If it wasn't that good, it wasn't good enough. So I hope I hope it was taken that way. And uh, I, I really hope that, that by the fall, I'm getting lots of stories from people that have integrated this into their lives, because I think this is like this is one of those things I see no good reason not to do it. It doesn't cost a lot of money. Everybody has a waste stream that they can tie into. Everybody that's growing food wants more fertile soil. Um, it's good for the environment one way or another. Uh, it doesn't harm anything. There's no need to ever cut down a tree to make charcoal like that. There's no reason for that. Um, even if we ever got to a point where we had gotten, um, we, we, we'd gotten so far ahead of things that we weren't, you know, cutting down as many trees as we do today and tr tr pruning as many trees. But you're using all the waste. You could still do it with coppiceable, uh, fast growing trees. Like there is no reason to clear land to make biochar. We have all the material that we need. I don't think we'll ever run out. And it is a hell of a skill. And it is something that you can do that you know that if somebody's on the land, you stewarded with it 500 years from now, it'll still be paying a dividend. There's not a lot of things like that out there. So uh, I, I, uh, I hope you guys got a lot out of today. Real quick, Cletus, ask one more question before I go. Given that biochar holds so much water, are wicking beds worth it? Uh, pumps, sump costs, et cetera. Well, a wicking bed doesn't have to have a pump. It can. A wicking bed is just a wicking bed. Um, I would say that biochar will make wicking beds better. And so I don't know that I would ever stop using wicking beds because even with its ability to retain water, it's still a, a finite amount of water in a container. Wicking beds are containers by uh, nature. Now, if you lived in a much more temperate climate than me, let's say Pennsylvania, and you were doing some container gardening and you were going to water twice a week and you added biochar, would it be worth your time to develop a wicking bed? I don't think it, it may not be. It all depends on how long you go between regular watering, what quantity we're talking about, how much labor it is, et cetera. Uh, I make wicking beds because I have aquatic systems that already have a pump and a sump. So I make those flow through beds that way because I already have the infrastructure. So I hope 
that answers that one. Everybody, again, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being here today. Uh, please share this one with anybody you know that maybe is not interested in preparedness and stuff like that, but they are interested in gardening and growing and permaculture because this is the best tool I believe that we have available, and it is a decentralized technology because anybody anywhere can do it. Take care, guys. I'll catch you tomorrow with expert counsel.